Uh. Ooh, yeah. Drop that beat. It's time to meet DP. So, welcome guys to another episode of DP and Me. That's me, DP, down Phoenix. But who's me, you ask? Well, that's a Magus X1, a.k.a. Anthony, or is it the other way around? I don't know. Well, I think you were probably Anthony first. Yeah, yeah, Anthony first. <laughs> yeah, but uh, anyways, welcome on to the show. I'm glad to have you on um, episode two of DP and Me, which a lot of people kind of wondering about that whole title. It's, I just thought it was kind of whimsical and fun to go with that kind of title. But if somebody wants to propose a different title... Let me know, you know, you can post a link in YouTube or hit me up at Twitter at Dow Phoenix or whatever you like. Um, email at the Dow Phoenix show at gmail.com. So how you been, Anthony? I've been pretty good. I've been pretty good. You know, it's uh, it's cool that I'm your second guest host on this. Yeah, this it really is. little podcast. Uh, you are on record in the history of Backlog Battle of being the only person to ever replace Alex on there. <laughs> yeah, I saw that. That was really interesting how that went out. I was I was really hoping he would have been there, but maybe uh whenever you guys do your game of the year thing, he'll you know, we'll all be on there. Oh, for sure. You yeah, we already have that plan. Yeah. So which I don't know if you listened to the first episode. I've already got a contender for my game of the year. But uh What's that? What's Hel- that? Hellblade. Hellblade, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. Uh that game is Really amazing. If you want to hear me discuss it in detail, just listen to the last episode, a.k.a. the first episode, and you guys will hear all about that, of course. Um, so I know that uh, it's actually been like a, about a month and a half or so since I was on Backlog Battle, something like that, right? Yeah, not that long ago. We recorded at the end of June, and then the episode came out in the middle of July. So yeah. so it's been about a month and a half since the recording, but a, maybe a month, maybe a month since the you know, the whole uh, episode was released. Right, yeah, most most certainly. So, uh, Backlog Battle is a show that I've been listening to for, I would want to say, close to two years now. I think I started listening to you guys around the tail end of 2015. Oh, yeah. And uh, I knew you did the podcast stuff, but I think at that time I really wasn't interested in podcasts. Like, I was like, do I really want to listen to a couple of dudes or a dude and a chick or whatever? talk for like an hour and a half <laughs> when I've got other shit to go on but it seems like you know as things have progressed and I don't know if it's just be me me getting older or something like that but I really started to enjoy that kind of content and uh that's really where you've been kind of delivering most of your creative uh work at least on the internet mhm yeah the podcast is mostly my ga- thing now so um well I still run the Mega Six and One channel from now to ne- from time to time and i have made that clear i'm not making any comebacks i have made that i'll still do videos but when i damn well feel like it so oh yeah for sure uh so can you go over like anybody that's listening i'm sure we probably will have some of the same audiences like obviously my audience is still really small since i'm still doing this but i'm sure that some of that has overlapped but maybe for those that uh, aren't familiar maybe you can kind of cover like some of the history of my backlog battle just you know my- kind of like a brief little thing Holy shit, my backlog battle dates back almost a decade. So I met my podcast partner, Alex, during the height of my YouTube days when I was, and now Justin here can reiterate that I was pretty popular in those days, right? Mm -hmm. And I met him during those, like the height of when I was popular, I guess you could say, that means anything. And uh, we talked for a few months and then we got onto a podcast. We started a podcast called TPPG, and the one thing we know Whoa, 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 hold on. TPPG? What's, what's that? <laughs> the Pixel and Polygon Protection Group was the first podcast we did. Okay, gotcha. And back in 2009. So we did that podcast and, you know, whatever. And one thing we noticed was Alex and I had good chemistry, but that didn't really shine through because, you know, the website associated with TPPG fell through and all that nonsense. And then a year or so passed, and we decided to do a new podcast called Gamer Horizon in 2012, beginning of 2012. And that one went through, but it also fell through because Alex actually got disinterested in games for a while. So we didn't really have anything to talk about at that point. Right, yeah, I mean, if it's a podcast called Gamer Horizon, you kind Mm -hmm. of are stuck to that uh, typecast, you know? It's not like you can totally (laughs) evolve that to something else. Exactly. 
then a, then a, I don't know if you know the singing pattern, but then in 2014, we we got back together because we missed doing the podcast. A lot of things had happened during that time, and we started a podcast called Social Link. It is the same podcast that Backlog Battle is. We just went through name changes, but the big difference is we've had an episode every week since February of 2014. Which that's really impressive. You know, I really hope I can kind of hit that kind of stride mm -hmm. uh, with this show, you know, be able to put out weekly content or even maybe multiple times a week. Because I actually thought about doing like mini episodes where it would just be me just covering like little shit. Um, right. Like, you know, a few minutes here or there just for people to like have something to go to. Because from what I understand, the way iTunes handles rankings, like in order to get into the new and noteworthy category, you have to put out stuff multiple times a week over an eight week period. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. I think that would be a really big boost. Well, well, the other thing is podcasts that are successful um, go more than 30 weeks. A lot of them fizzle. If they fizzle out before 30 weeks, they're not a good podcast. Right. So that's kind of the common thing. And Alex and I, with this one, we're well over 30 episodes. We're one. We're in the 180s now. So that oh, yeah. gives you the. And it's kind of crazy because, like, your podcast that you and Alex have had, you guys haven't technically been doing this particular podcast as long as, say, Xander has with the XX Gaming podcast. But, like you said, you guys release the episode every week. So you guys are up to, like, 180-something, right? And then mm -hmm. he's just barely hit the 100 mark, on the other hand, even though he's been doing it longer. Well, it's all about pacing, you know. There's yeah. popular podcasts. Some of the Kevin Smith podcasts, there's months in between some of his podcasts. So I don't think anything's wrong with either way. It's just that it works for us. And one of the things that's interesting is Alex and I do take breaks at times mm -hmm. from doing the podcast. But what we'll do is we'll do mass recordings. And when you were on the show, you were part of that mass recordings. We didn't record really any shows for the first couple weeks of July. Yeah, I always thought that was interesting because the episode that we recorded, I think we actually recorded the ep before the episode that came out before mine. <laughs> yeah. But even though our episode came out after, even though it was recorded before, I thought that was really interesting. No, no, no. no. The episode that came out before yours was recorded before you. No, no. Oh, it was? Yeah. I could have swore it was like after, like, I don't know the subject matter that, that, that you, talk, you guys talked about. I might have to re-listen to that. But um, where, where can people find My Backlog Battle? Well, you can find My Backlog Battle, our website, which has all of our podcast episodes, including those two aforementioned older podcasts dating back from 2009. So we have the whole archive. All of our stuff is on there that we've done together. Well, not all of our stuff, but all the podcast stuff that we've done is on there. So it's at mybacklogbattle.tv. MightBacklogBattle.tv. I'm going to it right now just to make sure. Yep, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> just to make sure you didn't goof it up like the other time. That. Uh, oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, there... in the latest episode, I, I I did goof it up. So, and yeah. Alex reprimands me, which is another thing we should talk about about my show real quick because that's the one thing I think grabs people's attention because Alex and I are not lovey dovey friends on that show, as you know. Oh yeah, for sure. It's it's a very. It's a very confrontational show at times. Um, that's the thing that's beautiful about Alex's and I friendship is is we don't hold anything back. Yeah, it, it's and always really entertaining to listen to, especially when we argue. <laughs> <laughs> when we, yeah. we, we get we, we we insult each other. And then, of course, uh, my favorite thing is uh, if you date back to uh, December, I still give Alex crap about uh, something that he said, which you probably know where I'm going. He made a very bad pun using the game Abzu. Oh, yes. I love that pun. <laughs> well, I mean, not, but, not, not, not because it was a good pun. I just was, loved yeah. how ridiculous it was. <laughs> and, the, and the reaction is, I think that's one of my favorite moments in the podcast because there was another guy, a friend of Alex named Tom, who's a pretty cool dude. And we were like, just what? <laughs> <laughs> Remember the reaction? The reaction is golden. Yeah, I mean, and, I know Alex oh, doesn't do a lot of YouTube stuff and whatever, but I think he should take a clip of just that segment of the show. That would be great. Oh, we are doing a lot of YouTube stuff lately. Well, though. I mean, I but like, be... obviously, you're doing new stuff, though. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, not really revisiting older stuff like you guys have done. Oh, 
Oh, yeah. And, and I know we need to move on, but I should talk about the YouTube channel as well. Because uh, I am kind of back on YouTube, but on the Backlog Battle podcast channel. Um, mm -hmm. What we do there is, of course, Justin had badgered us for years, for years to get on YouTube, to post a podcast on YouTube. And while I wasn't against the idea, well, I kind of was, I guess. Yeah, I was. We kind of were stubborn, but we finally did probably back in May, April down mm -hmm. there. And that was what the channel was for. But we've expanded the scope of the podcast to videos now. And right. recently, we we started a series back in June called Alex and Anthony Play Games, where we play a game together. One of us plays the game and we make commentary over it. I'm so, guessing, uh, do you guys just do like the uh, share play or whatever? Or, or, yeah. Yeah. Yep, but, we do share. That's a really good idea because, I mean... Like, whenever I said that, you know, I was thinking, well, you know, what's wrong with just backing up the episodes? Because Alex had the whole thing where you guys can only have so many episodes at once. Mm -hmm. And I figured, well, YouTube, the way it is, that's a good place just to archive stuff, which I guess it's not important now that you guys do have the website and the hosting and all that good shit that uh, you had before. But, you know, that was just kind of like my thought about, hey, why not try that? Since, you know, that way you guys don't really have to pay yeah. anything towards that. But, um, exactly. Yeah, and the episodes are on YouTube. So real quick, there's that series, and then we started a new series. I don't know if you saw the new series. Uh, trailer Brawl. Yeah, Trailer Brawl, where we watch trailers and just make commentary over it. Yeah, I imagine you guys will probably actually be having a new episode uh, up that probably shortly after this gets uploaded. Monday. Well, I, I think this is being uploaded tomorrow as of this recording. Yep. So, okay. uh, yeah, I've got yeah. the YouTube channel up here, but unfortunately, it's not a really easy link. Just search my backlog battle on YouTube and it'll be the literally the first thing that's going to come up. You know, check that oh, yeah, out. For sure. so, but uh, sure. anyways, um, let's go ahead and move on to uh, some gameplay. Like, uh, what have you been playing lately? Who? Um, well, we got a good Sonic game for once called <laughs> Sonic Mania. And, and I need to reiterate this, too, because I know some people have brought up Colors and Generations, which I have had, I guess, the pleasure to play, if you call it pleasure. And I guess the the reason why people cup in, I guess, Colors is because it was better than a lot of Sonic games at the time, which is not hard to do. Same with Generations. Okay. I'll just I'll just be straight up with you. I, I thought they were okay. They weren't stellar. And that's been sort of my problem with Sonic is that you know you look at those first three or four if you count Sonic and Knuckles and Sonic CD at, at those five games and they've been stellar stout amongst the best platformers ever made oh yeah without a doubt I mean I personally did really like Generations I thought Generations was a really solid title but at the same time I guess 3D Sonic games do have a little bit of a crux in the way they're designed and I think that's probably why a lot of people look at the 2D titles more fondly. It's just because they don't suffer with the same kind of flaws that the 3D ones do. Exactly, exactly. And and and, and even at that, the, some of the 2D ones have faltered, you know, like uh, those PSP games or those uh, Game Boy Advance games, you know. Um, but I, I and I still believe, you know, like generations and, and colors were OK at best. But I think we haven't had a stellar game in the tradition of those four gen those five games that were on the Genesis and Sega CD until Mania. Oh, yeah, for sure. Which I'm really looking forward to playing Sonic Mania. I haven't played it just yet. Uh, we're going to touch on that. Why in a little <laughs> bit? Uh, but uh, <laughs> but yeah. So what do you can you tell me about Sonic Mania? Like, what's your experience with that been like? It's been great. I think it's a fantastic game. There's a lot of replay value. Um, one of the ways I've been playing it is I've actually started several save files. And the reason I've done that is each time I play through, say, the first stage, as opposed to progressing through the game, this is the amazing thing about it. I discover something new in the level, mm -hmm. like a new secret or something like that. And sometimes I'll see something that I can't reach, so I'll go back and you know see if I can get it. And that's the beauty of that game is how so well designed and how exploratory it is in a way like the older Sonics used to be without it being so forced upon. It feels so organic. Right, right. That is one thing I think a lot of people that don't really understand why the 3D Sonic games aren't as good as a 2D, what they don't understand is the 2D Sonic games, they had a lot of layers to the stages, like the way that they're designed. There's multiple paths in pretty much every stage that you can take to get mm -hmm. to the end of the stage. 
Whereas, like, with a lot of the 3D Sonic games, like Sonic Adventure to uh, Sonic 06 to Sonic Generations to some degree, uh, they don't really have a lot of layers to progressing in the stage. Like, there might be some branching paths, but they're usually pretty limited in comparison. Exactly. Here's the thing that's hurt the 3D Sonic games. It's been two key components. One, bad design. Like you said, you know, not really imaginative level design, for sure. And the other thing has been gimmicks and mm-hmm. unnecessary characters, which I've got, which is it is known that I hate most Sonic characters, with the exception of Sonic, Tails, and Knuckles. And I'll give Amy a pass because she's from the Genesis era. Right. So, well, but, like it's not just that there's there's gimmicks because the old Sonic games had gimmicks too, even the very first one. I mean, you think about some of the stages, like the underwater stages, where you have to get those little air bubbles to keep breathing. That's a gimmick right there. Well, yeah, yeah, but I mean gimmick, really badly executed gimmicks where it dominates the game. I'll give you an example. Sonic right. Un- where it, it becomes a beat-em-up. Right, right. I, I see what you're saying now. It's like yeah. it, it, the newer games, they kind of wear that gimmick on its sleeve, and it really uh, drives the composure of that game whereas in the original games it was kind of like a fun little thing that you do like chemical plant zone is separate from green hill zone because of little gimmicks like that Mm -hmm. you know for example and um i think that's one thing they kind of miss you know is instead of having like a gimmick or two reinforce the whole game they should have just like little ones spread throughout the game which it seems like this one's doing um Casino, Casino Zone, for example, uh, can't talk today, but uh, from Sonic mm. 2, that's an excellent example of a, a well-played gimmick. I mean, that was practically its own game. That's mm-hmm. where Sonic Spinball came off of. It's just yep. that, that was so popular that people was like, this is really fun. You know, let's make this into a game. <laughs> I, you know, looking, you know, that level's okay. It's not, I, I'll be honest, I love Sonic 2. I think it's one of the best platformers. Mm-hmm. And I don't think Casino Zone is a bad level. But I don't think it's as good as the other levels in that game. Well, I mean, yeah, I guess yeah. Casino Zone does have a few problems of its own, no doubt. But, you know, that's one of those things that really helps separate that from other platforming games of mm-hmm. that time. Like, the only other platforming series that was really doing things like that, of course, was Mario. Right, right, right. So, so, so yeah. But back to Sonic Mania real quick. It's I, I think Sonic Mania is a brilliant game uh, so far from what I played. It's... One of the best platformers to have come out in the last, I guess, five years. And I can clump that with something like Shovel Knight in mm-hmm. its quality. Right. And it's just damn good. And and it makes me question what is the point of something like Sonic Force, you know? Right, right. Sonic Force is, um, they definitely have a very high bar to hit now. <laughs> I oh, think yeah. um, Sonic Team might be in serious trouble if Sonic Forces doesn't knock it out of the park i i think sonic team has been done for a long time no i mean like literally rather than figuratively is what i'm talking about. oh yeah yeah (laughs) oh yeah 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 but but i think yeah this would be the you know i mean if this game fails which i wouldn't be surprised if it did and i hate to sound pessimistic but we've seen we have seen the rec the you know the sort of record of uh Mm -hmm. of 3d games and I, I just don't see f- and 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 here's the other thing that I think has taken down Sonic games as well, and this is an interesting point: story. Mm-hmm. And what do I mean by story is that there's been this strange notion that Sonic games have to have these complex stories, and I'm a I'm a sucker for complex stories in video games. You know that, mm-hmm. but I don't feel it should be in every game. You know what I mean? Well, I think there's one easy thing we can blame that on, and that is the cartoon shows. Yeah, and the comic books. Mm-hmm. And the comic books. Like, if Sonic didn't have those, I think the storylines would probably be a lot more subdued, like, say, the Mario games. Exactly, exactly. And I think that's one way, one way that Sonic Mania has succeeded. And in its way of storytelling, one thing that I bring up is the ending of Sonic 2, for example. Mm-hmm. While they have a complex story, the ending of Sonic 2, those final three stages, you know, the one where you're flying with Tails on the plane, then that uh, air base, and then the Death Egg. Yep. Those all have like cinematic esque moments, and la- um, on the last time I recorded the podcast when Alex and I were talking to this, I compared those moments, and they're very emotional, but they're not complex. The the ending kind of I kind of compare it to the ending of Metro of, of another game with not with a very subdued story, and that's Super Metroid, where you know remember the ending to that where it's very emotional when you know you're fighting the mother brain, mm-hmm. and 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 I think Sonic Mania captures those moments so well. That's really good. That's really good. Um, 
So I'm looking forward to playing that, and I'm sure the next week I get on the podcast, whoever I have as a host, I'll be talking some great things about Sonic Mania to them. I hope so, at least. But uh, what I've been playing lately, um, I think I've kind of talked with you a little bit about it, but Mm -hmm. uh, I recently beat the very first Darksiders game, the War Mastered Edition on the PS4, and I was really into it, and so I decided to dive right into Darksiders 2. And uh, I just actually beat that last night for the second time, mind you. And this is a franchise that I don't really see a lot of people... I didn't really see a lot of people talking about it back in that era, back in 2012 when it came out. Mm -hmm. Um, But it was such an amazing game for its time, and sadly it didn't do as well as it could have, because it probably could have kept THQ from going bankrupt. If people realized how good that series was, if they actually like bought into it, and uh, wasn't wasn't the idea to make four games? Well, yeah, there was supposed to be a game for each character. So in the Dark Sider series, you play as the four horsemen of the apocalypse, and so in the first game, you play it as war, and then in the second game, the one I just finished, you play as death, and then this new one that's coming out, uh, you're going to be playing as fury. So, anyways, the idea with this game franchise, just kind of like to kind of sum things up, uh, the apocalypse happens on Earth, and uh, there is some kind of controversy behind that, though, because it doesn't happen like it's supposed to, because there are seven seals that guard the horsemen, like they don't come until all the seals are broken, but somehow uh, some somebody does something corrupted and it triggers war to come out but not the other horsemen and so this kind of like is a fake apocalypse even though it's a real apocalypse because like everybody on earth is dying and whatever and so war gets into some serious shit over the council which is kind of like these overlords of the universe that uh, kind of dictate everything you know there's there's a really complex story behind it all but um i don't want to get too much into spoiler territory but it's really a solid story it's not like it, yeah go ahead I, was, I didn't mean to interrupt i was just saying it is very i'm very happy that we are, are getting the third game finally after all this time oh yeah for sure i mean the third game from whenever they revealed it it did look kind of rough around the edges but i understand that's a pre-alpha build you know i mean it's, i know it's not going to be as polished as it could is it probably will eventually be but, uh, yeah, I'm really looking forward to it regardless, because when THQ went bankrupt, the fate of the series kind of was, like, in limbo, especially when one company, the the developer that made the game, Vigil Games, they got bought out by Crytek, and then Nordic Games is the people that ended up buying the Darksiders franchise. So that was kind of iffy, because I was thinking, well, how are they going to... They're going to have a new developer now, so it's probably going to play a lot differently. <laughs> Um, well, we'll see. And like you said, you know, what we did see of Darksiders 3, it is a, it's very rough. and It's not coming out until 2018, so we still have some time. Oh, yeah, for sure. And I'm sure that probably wasn't the most recent build that they showed us. They probably just wanted to kind of show people a taste of what we can expect, you know, as far as that game. Awesome, awesome. And, but, and I hope we do see a fourth one so they can complete their story. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, hopefully uh, if the third game turns out well, that's going to happen because... It seems like even though Nordic Games doesn't seem like they put out the best kind of games, uh, one thing they definitely do better than THQ is they don't burn a lot of money. <laughs> oh, yeah, for sure. So, uh, you know, it seems like they're a little more frugal and uh, responsible with the way they handle their finances. So, you know, that's that's always a nice thing. But uh, anyways, I guess um, I want to, you know, kind of touch on the gameplay elements of these games real quick. So they're both okay. action-adventure type games. Uh, the... There's three games that basically compile into Darksiders. So you have The Legend of Zelda, uh, specifically the Ocarina of Time style, Legend of Zelda, you know, 3D style. Uh, Then you have God of War. And then you also have Legacy of Kain, Soul Reaver. Those are the three games I think that have the most influence on the overall Mm -hmm. design of these games. So if you like any one of those three, you're probably going to dig this game. And you know, I love Zelda. I love Zelda and I love uh, Legacy of Kane, which is a series I would like to see rebooted. Right, right. Which I mean, all those, I mean, all those series have some kind of similarities to one another, 
Um, but Darksiders is kind of like the culmination of all three. Like, it shares something from all three of those. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't really do anything, like, innovative gameplay-wise, you know? Like, you're not going to expect something that's like, like, whoa, I've never seen that done in a video game before in this game. There is a lot of derivative elements. Um, it's more about just the overall execution uh, with how these elements play together. They, they play really well in this game. Um, plus, if you like kind of, like, really nice fantasy art style that's very imaginative uh this game does have some really neat art um i would say probably most similar to like the blizzard games like world of warcraft and whatnot gotcha so you know you're making me want to play this because i do have darksiders 2 on my ps4 mm -hmm. oh, i don't yeah, have the sure. original though oh you don't have the original um well th that's one good thing about this uh game series Although I think you do get the most impact if you play one and then two. At the same time, you do get enough backstory from playing two that it's not necessary to play one first. Right. Um, kind of some of the main differences between these games and the first game, it's a little more linear um, as, as far as the overall design. That one's a little bit closer to like Ocarina of Time. Whereas uh, Darksiders 2 is closer to say Twilight Princess. You know, it's more open ended and exploratory i guess in that regard uh and then of course the way you progress with your powers and such like i said darksiders one it's a lot more linear whereas darksiders two there's a little more backtracking and things like that going on you still have some of that in darksiders one i guess more to like a soul reaver kind of a degree and uh yeah but yeah, like um uh, Darksiders 2 does introduce a random loot system, kind of like Diablo, where you can oh, uh, yeah. get different kinds of weapons and things like that, armor pieces and whatnot, and you can kind of min-max your character and you know choose different kinds of elements to uh, customize your character, which is pretty neat. Um, that by itself is okay. It's not like the best implementation of it, but you do have also what's, what are called possessed weapons, where you can actually sacrifice your existing weapons to upgrade those weapons uh, to make them more powerful, to inherit traits of those weapons so that you can, uh, say, for instance, add fire damage or health stealing or various other elements like that to kind of, like, make it your style. Plus that is pretty awesome. Plus the stat tracking is really good. It'll give you, like, DPS counters and things like that so you can see what weapons are the most effective if you're really into min-maxing. That is pretty cool. I, I'm I'm kind of wanting to at least play two. I know you said we maybe we should play one, mm -hmm. but I think two would be a good one to play. Yeah. As far as the game lengths, I'd say the first game is probably about roughly 15 hours. And then the second game's probably about 20, 25 hours. So it's a little bit longer. So they're, okay. they're not like overly long, but they're definitely going to be longer than your typical action game. That makes sense. That makes sense. So, yeah, I've been playing that, of course. Uh, have you been playing anything else besides Sonic Mania? Um, I've been playing Mega Man Legacy Collection 2. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, uh. yeah. And, and people know that I adore, I adore fucking Mega Man 8, even though its voice acting is the worst ever. <laughs> Dr. Ryrie. <laughs> Dr. Ryrie. <laughs> Mega Man, you once heard Dr. Ryrie's castle. Oh, man, Alex and I did a, a upcoming video on that, so... Oh, awesome. That's going to be a try-playing episode? <laughs> yeah, yeah. We actually look at the whole collection in itself, so... So, how is the collection itself compared to, say, the first Legacy collection? Can you tell us about that a bit? I think, while the I like the collection, there are some serious things that I think are flawed. I would a lot... Mega Man 8, it, it, of all the Mega Man games, is notable for having several versions of the game... We only get the PlayStation version, which is a fine. Don't get me wrong; it's a it's a good version of the game. Mm -hmm. But I would have liked to see the Saturn version, which had extra bosses and things like that. Okay, it had like extra content. I guess. Yeah, it had some extra content, and then um, and then dual audio. Dual audio, like what do you mean, like stereo or? No, no, like Japanese and. Oh, okay, like different American language tracks. So you can choose yeah. which one you want. Okay, I gotcha. Yeah, I would have liked that. Um, but. You know, for for Mega Man Eight, I think the rest of the games are fine. I think Seven is underrated as all hell. Mm -hmm. Um, 
I think nine is a decent game, but it's a little too overly punishing, and its difficulty can be cheap at times. I think ten is a better game than people think it is. Right, right. So I, gotcha. I think I think there's solid games. My only thing is, is I think compared to the first one, I think in terms of games, it's a little thin. Four games for for what fifteen bucks or twenty bucks. Right. And I would have liked to see at least the two power battle games and Mega Man Soccer or something like that. In there. Right. Just like something a little bit extra just to be like, hey, you know, like, yeah, we know we're down to four games, but we got some extra whatever. Yeah. Or maybe like the Mega Man game on like Game Gear or like the Dr. Wily Wars from the Genesis or something like that. Right. Yeah. yeah. Something like that. That would have been nice. Right. Um, yeah. You know, I was actually surprised that they decided to do that as opposed to, say, a Mega Man X collection. I think that would have been a lot more sensical. I think that's incoming, though. Oh, yeah, I'm sure it's coming. I mean, if we got Legacy Collection 2, we got physical releases of 9 and 10, finally. Um, yeah, I, I imagine X is probably coming next year sometime. Yeah, yeah. Or in two years, because it's been two years since the original Legacy Collection. Oh, has it been? Yeah. Hmm. But I can understand why they did this one at the same time, because this is the 30th anniversary, I believe, for Mega Man. Or did Mega yeah. Man come out at 88? 87. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I gotcha. So, yeah, I'm thinking I might get that eventually, but I'm not a big fan of Mega Man 7 or 8. I don't know if it's just a change to, like, the bigger sprites and the level designs changing and things like that, but they don't really hold the same kind of uh, flair as the NES games did for me. I, th I think 8 does more so. Well, one, the sprite. Al Alex and I noted this in our commentary. The sprites are freaking huge on Mega Man 7. They are big. Right. And yeah, then when you switch. To, but when you switch to 8, they're they're not big, which is good. I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's smaller than 7, but they're still notably bigger than the ones in the NES games. Mm, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe. Yeah. Well, should revisit yeah. it or, or compare it to Mega Man 9 or 10, which I actually really dug Mega Man 9. That was a really well-made game. Alex and I did compare and we were we noticed it's kind of it's kind of hard to tell in those games because one of the weird things the Legacy Collection does is the screen width. So like the screen for 7 and 8 is bigger, but then when you go into 9, the default screen is just tinier. Now, I'm sure you can adjust that, but yeah, mm -hmm. we just noticed that. I gotcha. Yeah, you should be able to adjust it, I would imagine, because you were able to in the first games. Right. So, but, um, yeah, so what else I've been playing, of course, is um, if you, you know, I don't know, you don't have the VR, but one game I really was enjoying in the VR was uh, Job Simulator. I actually oh, did yeah. a live stream on that. Did you ever play Job Simulator? I've seen pictures of it, yeah. Yeah, so this game is really interesting because it takes place in 2050, which, if you think about it, is really not that far off. It's 33 years in the future. But you know how video games are with timing. <laughs> I mean, hell, we had a oh, Street yeah. Fighter 2010. It is nothing like nowadays. <laughs> but anyways, um, in this game, robots pretty much take over all of actual work. And so humans are just doing whatever the hell they want because they don't actually work anywhere because the robots manage everything. And so the robots ended up creating a simulation of human work in the early 20th century on what human work is like. And obviously they get it really far off. <laughs> oh, uh, shit. So, for example, you have like in the office worker job, you got a copy machine that you can make copies, you know, but it's not just of papers like we would think. It literally copies the exact object that you put in the copy machine. So you can put like a coffee cup or you can even put your own hand in the copy machine and it'll make a copy of it. <laughs> just <laughs> okay. really zany stuff like that. Um, this game uses both of the move controllers for the VR. So you have to have the move controllers. You can't use a regular controller because each controller represents your hand. And the only buttons you use are the triggers on the back of the controller, which is basically just to do a grabbing motion. You know, so if you hold right. the trigger, you're grabbing something. And when you let go, your hand is open. So in a way, it's kind of like Surgeon Simulator uh, with the way it plays out. And as you imagine, Surgeon Simulator is a really hilarious game, too. It's just really goofy and wacky and whimsical. And uh, a lot I remember of they had they had the Donald Trump 
add-on. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, this game's um, probably one of my favorite games I've played on the VR so far. Not because it does anything particularly awesome. Like, it's not, it, like, it's totally a game that they could have without the VR, although I think the move controllers would still be a necessity. Right. Um, But it's just the way that, well, I guess you'd still have to have some kind of way to track your motion in the game. I don't know. Maybe they could do that just with the move controllers, possibly. But anyways, I really highly recommend checking that game out, of course. I actually did a live stream that on Twitch, which might be gone now. <laughs> Because I think you don't really get your stream saved on Twitch anymore. I'll have to check on that. Yeah, uh, I don't know how Twitch works exactly. Yeah. Uh, let's see. No, it's still on there. I, I titled it Drinking on the Job Simulator. Because I actually had a little drink before I played the game. <laughs> it's It sounds like a good drinking game. I think you could make a drinking game out of yeah. it. Uh, the only downside to the game really is... You know, you, you you have four different jobs, and each job you do your um, you got different objectives that you can do in the game. You can obviously just goof off as well, but there is different objectives that you can accomplish to kind of like progress things. Right. And once you're done with that on all the jobs, you unlock uh, different cheat cartridges, like Game Genie cards in a way, where you put the cheat cartridge in first, which it'll do different things like low gravity or something like that. And that'll it'll just change the dynamics of the game a bit. But it doesn't really have any kind of elements of randomization. Like, I think one thing that could have helped is if they had, like, random uh, tasks for you to do. Like, uh, in the cooking minigame, for example, there's so many different things you could do in the cooking game. But you do, like, your 15 or so tasks that the game assigns you. And then other than that, you just goof off and do whatever you want. You know, it doesn't really... You know, I think it could add more random jobs. Essentially. There's a lot of, like, sandboxy stuff with these simulators coming out, it sounds like. Right, yeah, it has, like, a lot of good sandbox elements, but it doesn't really take them to its full advantage. You know, like with, like I said, right. the lack of pro uh, procedurally generated content, for example. It, uh, yeah, it sounds like something I would dig for a little bit, but I get bored of those kind of games for after a while. But, I mean, the good thing is it's a cheap game. And if you just want to play it just to get through the objectives, it only takes like, like maybe three hours to do all of them. Okay. So it's not a very long game. But um, I really had a lot of fun with Job Simulator, of course. So I highly recommend that if you happen to have a PlayStation VR, or HTC Vibe, or whatever kind of VR headset. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah, though, I think we've been playing some pretty good games, man. Oh, yeah, for sure. Have you been playing anything else yourself? or? Man. A little bit of Xenoblade Chronicles, but that's about it. I like the game. I think it has a pretty good story, but aside from that, not a whole lot. You've been playing the uh, 3DS version, right? Yep, yep, yeah. So, uh, have you actually beat the game yet? No, I'm working on it, though. Oh, okay, because it's kind of funny that you reviewed it without beating it. <laughs> well, no, we get, we, we get provisionary store scores, though. We do explain that. In oh, okay. Yeah, I forgot about that. So, how far are you into the game? Because I know it's a really I'm, long game. I'm about 30 hours. 30 hours. Yeah, you still got a ways to go, I think, with that. Yeah. I had a friend that beat it. He, I think he said it took him about 80 hours or something like that. So it's a long game. Yeah. But yeah. I'm sure he probably did some side quests and whatnot. How have you been doing as far as that? Uh, okay. I think the side quests are a little archaic in their design. Mm -hmm. But. Yeah, like yeah. fetch quests and whatnot. Kind of like. Yeah. Yeah. I think after The Witcher 3, it got spoiled on quests. Yeah, or even like earlier Witcher games, like The Witcher 2, I mean, it wasn't as good as the, as the third game in terms of side quests, but it still had some really interesting side quests that had multiple parts to them. But right, it just, right. They weren't as, I guess, story heavy, you know, they were a little more simplified as far as that, but they still had multiple objectives in them. Yeah, I like those Witcher games. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, there is one other game that I want to talk about. Uh, this is actually the very first review key I've ever gotten, which actually just kind of landed on my lap, and uh, I unfortunately got it a little later than I should have, because <laughs> they actually emailed it to me in, like, the beginning of July, and I didn't even notice the email until, like, the beginning of August, and they were asking me, hey, what would you think about the game? I was like, oh, shoot, they actually emailed me a key and stuff like that. I have no idea. Um... But there's this new RPG on PS4. It's called 
Fallen Empire or no Fallen Legion Sins of an Empire. Have you heard about this? Oh game? no, I have it. And then, uh, what do you think of it? Okay, so let me. I don't know. Like, I know nothing about it. So I'm only gonna kind of talk about it a little bit because I haven't played it a lot. I've got maybe two hours or so into this game, so this is kind of like just a more of a first impressions. Uh, but with this particular game, uh, the best way I can describe it, the art style is nice, simple 2D. I guess you could say it's similar to a Vanillaware game, not quite as refined as a Vanillaware game, but it still looks really nice. And, you know, it's all 2D stuff, of course. Ooh, is uh, it Japanese by chance, or is it? Uh, you know, I'm not really sure. The name of the company that makes this game is called Yummy Yummy Tummy Games. What the fuck? <laughs> but anyways, this is, a, as far as I know, a digital-only release. They have it for the PS4. And then they made a separate game based on the same thing. It's called Fallen Legion, uh, Burning Empire, so Burning something or other. I forget what it's called. That's the Vita version, which I'm actually going to contact them and see if I can get a review key of that one just to see if there's any differences. Uh, yeah, but yeah, uh, get a review key. But or, and you can also buy like a two pack and save ten bucks on PS because they're both like twenty dollar games. But you can buy both of them for thirty. Would have been nice if they had cross buy, but they're technically different games, so I can understand why they did it that way. Uh, but anyways, this is a RPG type game that uh, has some very simple and easy to understand mechanics, and it plays really fast. So this is a really good cat. Like if you want an RPG experience, but you don't have time to sink a couple of hours or more at a time into a game, you might actually dig this kind of game. So essentially, yeah. um, you play as this princess. Who, oh shit! <laughs> you play as this princess who um, is kind of like out in the field or whatever. You know, it's, it, she's like a warrior princess, I guess you could say. So she's not like your goody two shoe uh, princess that is all girly and everything like that. Well, anyways, her father dies, and in in battle, and so she is the heir to the throne. But there is a magical book. Um, I don't think I even know the name of the book yet. The game just refers to it as a grimoire. But this book can talk. <laughs> and uh, it's uh, very sarcastic and, uh, and crass in the way it talks. But anyways, uh, this book belonged to her father. And this book represents the ultimate power of the kingdom. So, in order to be the ruler of the kingdom, you have to have the book. And so, her father's, I guess, her right-hand man or whatever, he gives her the book. Mm. And so, she's supposed to try to take over the kingdom, you know, kind of reunite it. Because it's kind of in the middle of a civil war. There's a couple different factions kind of fighting for it, uh, since the king is dead now. And so, that's all I really know about the story, to be honest. There's really not a lot... Uh, to it, but it does have a lot of kind of silly humor to it. I guess you okay. could say it has some comparisons to like some Atlas or Nippon Ichi games in that regard. So it does have some kind of silly elements like that to it. I am wondering if it is Japanese because it sounds like it is Japanese. It definitely has some kind of dynamics between it, but I, I really don't know. Like, I'm not really familiar with this company at all. You know, I have never heard of them, so. But Sounds with like a, a solid game, though. But anyways, let me explain the gameplay of this game real quick. So, okay. uh, from what I understand, this is supposedly plays like Valkyrie Profile, which I've never played that series before in my life. I don't know what that game plays like. I have to probably kind of study it just to see if that's the case. But you have your princess, of course. You play as her, uh, but she's not a direct combat character. She's a support character. Uh, you have three combat characters, which you can choose from a variety of different characters that have different roles. Um, for example, uh, I only have three of them, by the way, which is how many you can have in your party for the direct combat, but I'm guessing you can unlock more as you play. So, uh, right now I've got a knight. You know, he's kind of obviously like a tank character, but he, he fights with a sword. And he's like all armored up and beefed up and stuff like that. And then I also have a uh, guy that he does... A spear, you know, he's a um, really fast, skilled fighter with a spear. And then finally, you've got my archer, of course. And the combat is really simple uh, with the way this game is played. Each character that you have, that you have assigned, 
is assigned to a button on your controller. So the support character, your princess, she's assigned to the triangle button. Right. The uh, knight is assigned to the circle. The spear guy is assigned to your X button. And then the archer is assigned to the square button. But you can actually arrange them however you want. Uh, because you actually do have a rotating uh, formation. Where basically the circle character, they're kind of like usually up front in the battle. And then the square is kind of more in the back. That's why I usually assign them that way is because obviously you want your tank in the front. But you can assign them differently if your tank's running low in health and you don't want them to die from an attack or something like that. You can kind of move them around a bit. Um, but literally all you do in combat, each character has a 3 AP gauge. You know, like a circular gauge where when they attack, they lose an AP and then they have to wait for another AP to come back. Um, all you do to attack is you literally just hit the button for that corresponding character. It's a really, really simple mechanic. Uh, so it's like an active turn base, I guess, style to it. But you just hit the button. You don't have to go through menus or anything like that that kind of slows the gameplay down. Uh, okay. So it sounds like an interesting dynamic type of game, you know. Oh yeah, yeah. It's, like I said, it's a really simple game to play. Like you, pretty much in the first five minutes of the game, it does like a short little tutorial just to kind of introduce how to play the game, explain some basic elements of it, and then after that, that's like it. There's like no tutorials. It's pretty much like the opposite of Final Fantasy 13 in that regard. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, it, I got you. Okay. Yeah. You know, it's it's like in and out. It teaches you the game right then and there, and then you just gotta kind of learn the nuances from there. Uh, so there's a couple of uh, there's a couple of things that are nuanced to this, of course. First of all, you have a combo gauge on the bottom of the screen, which kind of um, the combo gauge. You know, when you get uh, successful attacks, it'll build up on the gauge, and then it'll have like certain spots on that combo gauge where if you get to that point, you'll per um, perform what's called a death blow move, which depending on which button you hit at that time, you know, depending on which character can have different effects because each character has different kinds of death blows um, that can kind of add status effects and things like that to the battle. Uh, so that's a really interesting mechanic. Although if you get hit by the enemies, that combo gauge resets to zero. So oh, that makes to, sense. Yeah. And so when it comes to getting hit by the enemies, there's really only one recourse you have to that. So you have the R1 button, or is it the L1 button? I'm actually kind of blanking out which what button it is. I think it's the L1 button, actually, now I think about it. But whenever the enemies are getting ready to attack, you want to press the L1 button um, so that you can lessen the damage from the enemies. But if you time your button press just right, so where you press it just before they connect on their attack, you'll actually gain a free AP point for every character. So, and it'll also like pretty much nullify all damage, so it won't affect your combo gauge if you do that. So this is the way you've really got to play the game effectively. You obviously got to do your combos and stuff like that, but you have to be very mindful about the uh, defense mechanism as well. Because you can't defend while you're in the middle of an attack. So you have to be... It's a very timing-oriented game. So it's um, deceptively simple in the way you play. Because you can totally button mash the game if you don't know what you're doing. How much is this game? Uh, it's $20. That's not bad. Yeah. Uh, but I'm actually going to be doing a review on my channel uh, once I actually get through it. But that might take a little while. But now that I'm finished with Darksiders 2... I'm going to kind of focus on that game as well as Sonic Mania, which, I mean, that's not going to be a long game, so. Oh, yeah, Sonic Mania isn't going to be long, but I'll probably play it to death. All right, so uh, I think that's all I had to talk about, about games we've uh, been playing lately. <laughs> yeah, same here. We Not a whole lot on my end, but, you know, it's that time of year. I got gotcha. you. Okay. Yeah. And so that means it's time to talk about the news that nobody cares about. That's right. There's a whole bunch of gaming news that happens every week. But there's certain things that people just don't really care about at all. Uh, so let's go ahead and get into some of these topics. So I don't know if you heard about this, Anthony, but we do have a great new addition to the Dishonored franchise. We have a new DLC that comes out, Death of the Outsider. So I don't know if anybody's oh. playing Dishonored 2 still, but uh, you got the new DLC. Uh, <laughs> you ever played Dishonored 2? No, I'm not very interested in that game, to be honest. 
Oh, uh, really? I mean, it's it's actually a pretty good series. I haven't played the second one, but I mean, at this point, who's really going to care about DLC for a game that came out like almost a year ago at this point? Yeah. Yeah. Last year. Yeah. <laughs> Which that's why it's on the news. Nobody cares about, of course. Um, so let's see what else we've got here today. So, uh, you know what? Actually, I didn't really prepare for this segment. <laughs> But I do have something else, of course, that I do want to bring up. Uh, right. Did you know that they fixed Chun Li's face in Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite? Oh, that's good. But yeah. I still, yeah, I'm not feeling that game. Yeah, I think Capcom should have probably fixed that uh, before they started showing the game off. Maybe they wouldn't have got such a bad press. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, it seemed it's kind of a weak game. I don't know. I played that story mode demo from E3. Mm -hmm. And I didn't feel it. Right. And, of course, I know you really love this franchise, but Shinmu 3 has a publisher. Uh, it's going to be published by Deep Silver Games, which uh, means I'm probably going to be very wary of the game now. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That they, company... uh, they did a really good job of promoting Mighty Number no. 9. Oh, they did a fantastic job on that fantastic game. So, yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> which, I mean, it really wasn't that bad of a game. It's just... I mean, Deep Silver pretty much tanked the marketing on that game. You ever watch that uh, trailer, that infamous trailer that they did for, for Mighty, Mighty Number no. Nine? Nine? Yeah, you know the anime fan on prom night. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, jeez. Um, apparently, if you've never played Valkyria Revolution, this game is dirt cheap now. Like, I see this game's like plummeting on price. If I remember right, I uh, have you ever played that game, Valkyria Revolution? Yeah, you guys played There's it on your. Uh, yeah, you know, we get a video of it. Um, this game is down to like fifteen dollars now. It literally yeah. came out two months ago. Like, what happened with that? <laughs> no clue. I mean, it's, it's it's not a bad game. I heard. Oh yeah, it's not at all. But at the same time, like, what happened? Because like, you got Valkyria Chronicles remastered. That's still holding pretty steady at its original price. Like on Amazon, you can get it for like twenty eight bucks. That's only like a couple bucks cheaper than it was at launch, but. I don't know what happened, Sega. I guess you guys have been selling too well on that one, unfortunately. Hopefully, uh, yeah, hopefully, uh, Yakuza Kiwami and uh, Sonic Mania will kind of change your fortunes around a little bit. It hasn't been a bad year for Sega. Yeah. And I guess that's all we've got for the news that nobody cares about, because nobody cares about it, but somebody's got to cover it, right? <laughs> right. Okay. So I want to get into the real uh, news topics that we want to talk about today. Um, I know you don't talk a lot about the xbox uh stuff right. but there is one thing i really want to talk about xbox related so we've got the xbox one x that's coming out at the uh end of this year i think it's in november or something like that but uh one of the games that people have been really looking forward to to kind of help launch that system is the new crackdown game crackdown 3 uh it's literally been like i want to say eight years since crackdown 2 came out and right. uh, the original crackdown on the 360 was actually like one of the first really impressive games i played on the 360 with the way it was designed you know it was open have you ever played the original crackdown i did play the original it was okay yeah i mean it wasn't like the best game like nowadays if we go back and look at it it's probably going to seem kind of primitive but it was doing a lot of things that games that didn't come out until later uh, did of course you know it, it uh right. games like infamous and grand theft auto 4 and so so on they really borrowed some elements from the crackdown game uh with the way they did things and uh it, it was a really good game for its time so uh, now understandably a lot of people were looking forward to crackdown 3 partly because microsoft doesn't have anything else of, of importance coming out but <laughs> Oh, uh, no, they don't. Yeah. <laughs> but anyways, uh, Crackdown 3, unfortunately, got delayed until spring of 2018. And uh, I kind of feel like this is going to do some serious damage to the Xbox One X. Um, what do you what do you think about that? Um, well, there, you know, there's a reason why I don't buy an Xbox. And again, I'm not going to tell get mad at people for buying Xbox or worry what other people buy. But I don't feel the Xbox has the support that the PS4 does. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Especially first party and second party wise, you know? Oh, yeah, I mean, for sure. I mean, I have an Xbox One S mm -hmm. and I do like the system. You know, I think it's a really solid console. But that's the thing, though. It's a good console. Uh, it doesn't have a lot of good exclusive games. 
So that's kind of like a major problem that the PS4 has a definitive advantage on. Oh, yeah, um, for sure. I mean, it's not like it was with, say, the 360 and PS3. They both had really solid games. Or, like, even the PS2 and the uh, original Xbox. You know, I mean, obviously the PS2 was ahead, but the original Xbox still had a lot of unique games of its own Yeah, that um, weren't on other systems, or maybe they were on PC, but it wasn't like nowadays where, like, 95% of the games that get announced for the Xbox One are also on the PC. So it's yep. like, is it yeah. really that much of an exclusive, especially since PC gaming is so much easier to get into now? It is. So. And thanks to things like steam and things like that, for sure. Right. Right. Which I mean, back in the sixth gen, seventh gen, you know, PC gaming wasn't so ubiquitous and easy to do. So if somebody was to say like, Oh, you know, as to say, Oh, you can't play Knights of the Republic or Morrowind or, uh, Jade Empire or something like that on the PS2, you could play, but they're like, well, I can play on the PC. You know, a very valid response would have been, well, good luck setting that up. <laughs> you know, Good luck yeah, actually yeah. getting your game to run on that PC. Um, but that's not really a, a legitimate reply anymore because it's easy to do that stuff now. I mean, oh yeah, it is. It is. There's, I mean, there's cheap uh, alternatives to gaming PCs and things like that. Too, mm -hmm. So, and it's not like everybody has to play on the highest settings. Yeah, I mean, people always say the whole, oh, it costs $2,000 to build a good gaming PC. Well, yeah, if you want max settings on everything, perhaps. But, you know, you can easily build a capable machine that will be playing everything that you can for under $500, no problem, you know. And uh, you can do a lot more with that PC than you can with, say, a PS4 or Xbox One. But, um you know, without this game, the only game that we really have that's for sure going to show off the One X's capability at launch is Forza 7. Which, I mean, racing games are beautiful, no doubt. I'm sure it's going to look gorgeous on that system. But is that really going to be enough for people to upgrade? No, that's, it's not. It's yeah. Not. So, I mean, people will crap on the PS4 Pro all day, but at the very least, Sony actually puts out a number of exclusive games and it does give the PS4 Pro some advantages over the original games, even on games that have already been released long before, since you could do like the boost mode and stuff like that. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. It's just the Xbox brand is kind of just eh, at the moment, you know, for me. Right, it's right. Not, yeah, it's just not everything that i want for me as a player and again there's fans of crackdown and halo and gears of war and that's fine but for me everything that i want is on the ps4 you know right right and i mean it would be a little bit different like if uh the xbox got more third-party games like if it was getting more rpgs and things like that you know i can understand why somebody would go with an xbox one over a ps4 even though they might have more exclusive games on the ps4 like sony made ones if the Xbox is doing a lot better job with getting the third parties, then, you know, I think, uh, I don't know. I just, like, like, with the whole PS3 versus 360, I thought it was very easy to understand why one person would choose one or the other. Because they both right. had very distinct advantages. Uh, but really, the main one that the Xbox has is backwards compatibility. Which, mm -hmm. if you really want to play 360 games, you can get a 360 dirt cheap now. You know, oh, I've, yeah. I've seen them as cheap as like 50 bucks, you know, with the hard drive and everything. So it's, that's not really that, that good of an excuse anymore. Yeah. I, I, I yeah, I got nothing else to say on it. I, I think so. Right. And so I guess we'll go ahead and move on to our next topic. So we have the um, Nintendo switch, of course, you know, it has the joy cons that you can um, play separately or you can slide them into the joy con grip. Right. So you can play it like a more traditional controller. So, obviously, when it comes to certain gamers, that is a problem. It's really difficult to, um, uh, you know, play those games if you have certain dis disabilities. Like, say, for instance, if you only have one hand, uh, which that's why I read this article on Polygon. They actually have a one-handed controller coming out for the Nintendo Switch. Have you seen this controller uh, grip that they have for it? I did see, and I think it's a fantastic move for people with disabilities. I yeah. really do. It's really neat. I think it's great. And I think yeah. even, even if you're not disabled, if you're just playing a game that's more simple, like, a, say, a turn-based RPG or something like that, 
and you just kind of want to chill, you can use this grip and control everything in the game just with that, assuming that it's not a game that can work on just one Joy-Con, of course, but... Exactly, exactly. I, I, I applaud this move. This is a fantastic decision for the one-handed controller. And, uh, you know, it's too bad that we don't see the other companies do it, you know? Right, right, for sure. I mean, there are a lot... There actually are a lot of accessories uh, that they release for different consoles and PC and whatnot. But, I mean, if you're a disabled gamer, PC is probably your best way to go just because there's not nearly the number of restrictions on accessories... You know, they right. actually make special controllers uh, for people that have various disabilities. Like, I've seen uh, controllers that people can control just with their mouth, which I can't even fathom, you know. Oh, yeah. Even I though I see I these videos, I see these people playing their games with their mouth, you know, like like blowing on little tubes and whatnot. Like, I, I mean, if I was in that such bad of a shape, there's no way I could play games anymore. I don't think I really have the patience or the uh, skill level to really get into something like that. That's a that's really crazy. The blowing into tubes. So this thing is um, it's not like an official product right now, but they're really wanting to make it one. Um, Julio Enrique, Enrique Rito Vasquez. He's also known as Valexius. He uh, made this 3D printed controller accessory for the Nintendo Switch, where you can essentially slide both Joy-Cons together um, okay. so that they're really close and you can kind of hold it in one hand pretty easily. So at least for people like I mentioned, you know, it's easy to play. Plus, you know, you have your SL and SR buttons, you know, on the side. There's actually like a little uh, dongle or something like that you can manipulate with your finger to still be able to hit those buttons. I That does, that sounds very cool. I like, I like this. I applaud them for this. So hopefully we um, will see something like that actually come to market. But uh, I'm really excited for that. You know, for you know, even though it doesn't, I don't have a need for it. You never know. You know, <laughs> you never know what could happen in life. Exactly, it's a good idea. So, uh, speaking of market, of course, uh, Amazon has not been doing too well with the market. <laughs> Lately, okay. they've uh, really been screwing th some things up. There's actually multiple things I want to talk about with Amazon. So, uh, first of all, it's, this is one that's kind of personal. Um, okay. You were talking about Sonic Mania earlier. I know you probably downloaded it off the PlayStation Store. Yeah, because I, I don't do I don't do physicals much. Which that's I mean, they don't have a physical release of that game, anyways. Like even if you wanted to play a disc copy of the game, uh, Sega hasn't published one, at least yet. Right. Uh, but Sega did put out a collector's edition. For Sonic Mania, um, which has a nice huge Sonic statue. It's like a foot tall. And he's standing on top of a replica Sega Genesis Model 1. That oh. has even like the little volume knob and things like that. It's really neat. Uh, so I actually just got mine today. But the problem with that is the game came out on Tuesday the 15th. Mm -hmm. And I got mine today. And I have Amazon Prime, which is supposed to be free two-day shipping. And Amazon typically does release date shipping on everything. But for whatever reason, they didn't with this. Like, I've had this issue before. Yeah. It's like yeah. They, they selectively list which games they do release date shipping for. And I've never... I, I have had a problem with the Mario Kart 8 Deluxe for the Switch. I didn't get it until the day after launch. But... That was kind of a separate issue because that was listed as real estate shipping. That was a mess up on their part, essentially. This, I don't know. It just doesn't make a lot of sense, especially since I pre-ordered it back in September of last year. Right. Back when it was $70. Now, I will, to Amazon's credit, uh, for whatever reason, uh, they had a weird price drop on Sonic Mania where it dropped down to like $43.56. And so I actually got it for that price, even though I originally pre-ordered it at the $69.99 price. Right, and that right. was really cool. But still, I mean, they really dropped the ball on the way they release this. Because obviously, if I wanted to get the game at launch, now I'm going to have to think about, well, maybe I should pre-order to GameStop or something like that. Because Amazon doesn't really do a good job of ensuring that we get the games on time. No, they, they don't. I had this problem with Dragon Quest Eight yeah. back in January. 
Right. And, I mean, that said, you know, Amazon does still have some benefits, uh, especially if you're a Prime member, although it seems like they're really kind of cutting away at that. Uh, first of all, their whole, um, whenever you pre-order a game, you know, you can get 20% off whenever you, whenever you pre-order a game or if you buy it within the first two weeks of the game's launch. Which, you know, if you're really interested in a game, but you're kind of on the fence and you want to see what the reviews are like... You know, I can understand why somebody might wait until, like, shortly after launch to buy it. Well, if you're one of those people, be wary because they are actually getting rid of the 20% discount. Effective now. Uh, this is actually a news article. Uh, where, where were, I actually forgot where that was. Do you remember where I sent it from? Um, I can check for you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, you know, um, just tell them what it is, though. They're getting rid of it. Oh, okay. So, yeah, they're getting rid of the discount for the first two-week purchase. So you'll still get the 20% discount if you pre-order the game. But if you're one of those holdouts that's going to wait just to see Tech what they're... Tech Raptor, by the way. Oh, the Tech Raptor is actually for the other story that I'm going to cover. This was from comicbook.com. Okay, my uh, But, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I just don't like the idea behind that. But since we are talking about the other story, too, at the same time, if you're in Canada, you're even getting hosed even further. Because on top of having inflation and having your games cost like about roughly $20 more than they do in the U.S., you're also going to lose part of your Amazon discount. In Amazon Canada, they're actually confirmed to go from 20% to 10%, which this is something I found out on uh, Tech Raptor. And uh, now, bear in mind... Amazon did confirm that if you already pre-ordered a game at before the change, you'll still get the 20% for that. But for all new orders, it's going to go down to 10% starting now. That's pretty dumb. Which, you know, I can understand why Amazon's making some of these changes. They're a company. They're trying to make a profit and things like that. Um, and when they offer the 20% discount, they're basically making no money off of those games. You know, with the way these right. companies sell them. But... At the same time, it's a way to encourage people to continue subscribing to Prime because Prime costs $100 a year, whereas a similar service like Best Buy Gamers Club Unlocked is only $30 every two years. So right. they're just helping drive people more to Best Buy. Um, unless, I guess, they're kind of attached to Amazon's other services like Amazon Video and whatnot. Yeah, it's a, it's a weird move, but I still think Amazon Prime has a lot to offer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. So, it, it does still have some things to offer. I'm not going to, like, immediately cut my subscription to Amazon or anything like that anytime soon. But, in protest. <laughs> but at the same time, um, I'm probably going to start looking at getting, like, games that I really want at launch. I'll probably start looking at getting them at uh, Walmart or GameStop or something like that instead, you know, just... Yeah, that's a good point. I think uh, it depends on where you get it from. Now, me, I, I don't worry too much about it because I'm not into physical copies that much anymore. Mm -hmm. So I buy a lot of it from PlayStation Store, but still, you know. Yeah. Well, I mean, so I think some physical game or some digital games actually do get discounts on Amazon. It's, it seems pretty rare, but I have seen a few. Yeah. Huh. That, I wonder which ones. Yeah. And as a matter of fact, speaking of uh, digital discounts, uh, game, uh, Green Man Gaming right now, they're doing a 10% off sale on PlayStation Store credit. Uh, so if you want to get some games for PS4 or PS3 or whatever, pretty cheap, you know, like um, you can buy some credit on there and, you know, build that up. So you can get like $100 credit for $90, for example, and kind of bank that. And that'll help you buy a little bit more off of there you just, they have like a promo code you have to use but gotcha. that's, always, that's always an option for someone like you that does digital yeah i could i could look into that i think So, welcome back, guys. And today, we are going to be checking out a new segment called Rapid Fire This or That. So, I asked my guests, 
what he thinks between two different things, and he has to choose really quickly. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and go through that, Anthony. So let's go ahead and ask you real quickly. I know you're answering this one already, but is it Marvel or DC? DC. Most definitely, for sure. And how about uh, Final Fantasy or Dragon Quest? A Final Fantasy. Okay, and which Final Fantasy? Final Fantasy VI or seven? Six. Okay, and would you say Kefka or Gestal? Kefka. Okay, and would you say the Joker, uh, Jared Leto Joker, or would you say the Joker, Heath Ledger Joker? Um, the, just the Joker. Uh, Heath Ledger or Jared Leto? Oh, Jared Leto Joker, actually. Really? That's interesting. Yeah. Okay, and speaking of Jared Leto, would you say Requiem for a Dream or Dallas Buyers Club? <laughs> uh, Requiem. Okay. And that's all we've got time for, people. Anthony really likes Requiem for a Dream. <laughs> It's a it's a screwed up movie. Yeah, for sure. Did you ever watch Dallas Buyers Club though? Yeah, it wasn't it wasn't bad. it wasn't bad. It was pretty good. Yeah, I but say. it's not as bleak as Rick Green. Well, yeah, for sure. <laughs> I mean, it's bleak for him, right? The guy he plays as. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, but that character is more sympathetic than the one he plays in Requiem. Oh yeah, for sure. Uh, so we're gonna go ahead and wrap things up. Uh, this would be kind of like the main discussion that we're gonna have. This is not really based on a news story. This is more of like a thing that's recently been going on in the community. So I know you're not a huge fan of physical releases, Anthony. So I know right. that your take on this might be pretty unique compared to, say, my take. I actually like physical releases when possible, but I'm not opposed to downloading games either. If a game's only available digitally, and it's when I want to play, I'll get it, you know. Or if it's on right. sale, I'll get it, you know. I'm not going to, like, hold off on doing physical-only games in, mm -hmm. in the hopes of that game maybe someday coming out physically, you know. I'll, if it's a game I really want to play, I'll just get it digitally, whatever, you know. But there's this right. company. They're based out of North Carolina. Uh, they're called Limited Run Games. And uh, for the past couple of years, I think they started in 2015, they've been releasing physical releases of previously digital-only games. Um, and they do them in limited batches, which um, at first, when they first started, they were kind of like a small, no-name company. And they would do like a batch of 2,000 games or something like that. It was like whatever the minimum they had to publish for Sony to basically allow them to do it. Cause they're only on PS4 and Vita. Um, and their business model has really expanded. They've gotten a lot of popularity over this amongst the collector collectors of the community, but they have not at all done a good job with it after their initial, uh, limited runs. Like their games sell out mm -hmm. almost immediately. Oh um, Yeah. You know, they just had, last week they had a limited run for Night Trap. And it literally sold out in under two minutes. And we know Night Trap's not a great game. Oh, no, it's <laughs> but, not. A, it, I wouldn't buy a Night Trap. I would it, not buy Night Trap. But it's a game that, obviously, even though it's not a great game, it does have its place in the history of gaming. It has a lot of notoriety and nostalgia to some people. And some people probably just wanted to get it because they never played it back in the day. And they just want to see what it's like, you know, because it's definitely a unique kind of game. But uh, Limited Run has done a terrible job with the way they've been releasing games like this. And the, okay. and the way that they do it and in the quantities that they do it. I know the title of the company is Limited Run Games. But they're so much more popular than they were before. Yet they're not really producing more games. You know, I'm really curious as to why that is. Maybe so, to maybe to keep it limited run. I don't know. Literally, that well, might be it. But I mean, at what point does it stop being limited? Because like, say, if a game had, say, 5,000 or 10,000 copies, that would still arguably be a very limited release compared to what a mainstream game might have. Agree. That's a good point, too. Yeah. So, I mean, what's your thoughts on Limited Run? Limited Run, um, it's a cool idea for collectors. It's an idea that I don't afford to because, you know, my stance on digital, how I like digital. But I'll say this, though. I, I have not liked some of their practices. Um, this is one of them. Another one I could mention is some things with YouTube gamers. I won't get into that, but, you know, 
Oh, you I know, know exactly kinds. what you're talking about. I, I we don't have to name names, of course. Yeah, yeah. But well, they they give certain popular YouTubers more copies than they should of games, and that hurts them. And that run, they you know, it's kind of a BS move, in my opinion. Right. And that hurts the limited run. That probably is you know they they do too. Look, I bet you they produce more than two thousand copies. Oh yeah, or whatever um, it is. I mean, actually, they make more games now. I think they they actually just had a limited run today for uh, N plus plus and uh, another game called Lily. I'm not really familiar with those games, but they just did a limited run today. Of course, uh, Lily sold out really quick. I don't know how fast it was. I, I doubt it was as fast as Night Trap because I'm not really familiar with the game. But N plus plus, at least the last time I checked, was still available, but it was pretty depleted. So I imagine it's probably sold out by now. Right. But, um, okay, so yeah, with the YouTuber thing, that's a very good point, you know, because I actually remember one such YouTuber um, that, you know, Limited Run, of course, gave them some games as kind of a promotion so that they can kind of show off and talk about some of their various products that they offer, you know, and that, and that was their whole intention, I think, of reaching out to that YouTuber is they wanted to kind of build up that brand recognition uh, to bring more people over, which... It's a really weird idea behind it. Like, why would they bring more people over by popularizing it if they're not going to increase the overall quantity of games they're producing? Exactly. And the games that they gave this YouTuber were already sold out. So right, how does exactly. that make Right, how exactly. Does that make they, sense? Were, they were out of print, essentially. Like, which, from what I understand, uh, from what they explain, they do produce extra copies besides what they sell. For a couple of different reasons. They uh, do it for, obviously, to replace lost or damaged games. Like, if they send a game to somebody and it gets lost in the mail, for example, they'll still have some copies that they can kind of refulfill that order. Which, that's that's a good idea, you know, especially when you got something like that. Because, I mean, one thing that would really piss somebody off is if they have such a limited number of copies and then their game gets lost in the mail or it gets damaged in transit or something like that. And then limited runs like, oh, well, you know, we don't have any more copies. Sorry, bud. Right. We'll refund you or whatever, you know. But that, that's still going to piss people off. So I can understand why they do that. And I understand that they set a few copies aside for promotional reasons like giveaways and um, to give to YouTubers and such. But this particular YouTuber we're talking about, of course, uh, limited run gave them like eight different titles or something like that. It was like seven or eight yeah. titles. Which I think was a little excessive for promotional purposes. They could have gave them like two or three, and that would have been plenty sufficient to kind of demonstrate and, some of the different titles that they offer. And you and I got into a Twitter fight, not with each other, but against them and a few supporters of that YouTube. Right, exactly. Yeah, um, that, yeah that's a very good point there. Uh, you know, and I, I get it. It's it's limited run. Like like you know, not everybody is necessarily going to get a copy of the game, but at this point. I don't see why they can't do pre-orders because I've yeah. seen other sites like uh, Fan Gamer, for instance. I don't know if you knew this. You, I know you were like Shovel Knight. Did you know that they had a physical release for the Vita? Yes, I did. And it was only available at one place, which was Fan Gamer. Mm -hmm. And this was literally their first ever physical game that they put out. Um, right. I think they put out like a couple since then, but Fan Gamer is known for more for merchandise and things like that. But they actually put out a physical copy of Shovel Knight, I think for like thirty bucks. They opened it up for pre-orders for people to pre-order a copy. They did say that they weren't going to produce more than ten thousand. That was like basically their limit, but they were going to take pre-orders up until that point. But you know, they did the pre-orders. Everything went through smoothly, and they released the game pretty much on schedule like i think it might have been a little bit later but they were pretty much on time with uh their estimations with that game uh limited run part of the reason why they don't do pre-orders is because they did a pre-order for skull girls uh for mm. the ps4 and vita and um they really screwed up badly with the pre-order of that which it wasn't all their fault, mind you. Uh, some of it was that the one of the pre-orders they had was for Skullgirls for the Vita. And the Vita version kind of got pushed around and screwed up. You know, like um, it took a lot longer than it was supposed to to actually come out. Right. And with the way they had things tied, I guess 
because some people ordered both the PS4 and the Vita copy, they wanted to wait until both were ready before they released it. And still to this point, as far as I understand, they still have not put out the limited run release of that game. Oh, wow. And okay. this was a pre-order that happened like a year ago. What? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it's not, obviously, like I said, it's not all the fault of limited run. You know, a lot of it actually does hold on to the developer because they didn't want to put out a physical release, I understand, until the game was more or less done. Like, they were done working on it. So, they were still patching the game and things like that. But still, like, that's kind of ridiculous. When every other company that I've seen do something like this haven't had that trouble uh, with the way they've yeah. been releasing those games. Matter of fact, Fangamer uh, did a pre-order for Undertale for the PS4. That just came out. And uh, I think they're getting ready to ship that, if I'm not mistaken. I think uh, Limited Run needs to evaluate the way they do business, reevaluate. Which, okay, so, like, I mean, they had a major failing with the that one pre-order that they did. But I'm sure they've learned a lot from that. I mean, I don't understand why they still stray away from that model. Just because they had one major misstep, which was, like I said, wasn't entirely their fault. You know, there was other parties involved as well that screwed up. Right. Right. And that's an important point. Right. So. Yeah. <laughs> I just hope that, uh, you know, for everybody's sake, I mean, I think they should consider releasing more copies. And, uh, you know, they did a um, release of Wonder Boy, the Dragon's Trap for PS4. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, obviously that sold out really quick. I think that sold out in like five minutes. And I kept telling people, Play Asia has had this game for two months. You could have already been mm. playing a physical release of this game if you would have just bought it from Play Asia. And they didn't do any arbitrary, oh, we're only going to sell like 3,000 copies and then that's it, you know, kind of thing. Well, Play Asia is, is a pretty good place to go. Yeah, I've actually bought a couple of games from there before, and I uh, highly recommend checking them out. Um, like I said, Fan Gamer has done a few game releases. I am 8-bit. actually bought a copy of Hyper Light Drifter uh, from there. I still need to play that. But, um, yeah, there's a lot of other alternatives to that, you know, and uh, I, I do hope that Limited Run gets their act together with it because they obviously have the notoriety, but... If they keep pissing people off, they're going to look for alternatives. Yeah. You know, and those alternatives might ironically push people to buying digital games because maybe they do, just don't want to deal with the uh, forced obscurity of these games. You know, maybe yeah. Maybe they, they just want to play the games, so they'll just go ahead and download off the PlayStation Store or the Xbox Store or wherever, you know, instead of having to deal with all the stress involved with that. Yeah, I have my criticism of Limited Run. They It was a cool idea, but with the favoritism they gave to certain people and all that, it makes me question them, so. But I hope that they do better, you know, because I'd like to see that model be more successful, but at the same time, they could still be a limited release without having to put out such a small, arbitrary number. Gotcha. Yeah. So I think that's about all the time we have for today's episode of DP and Me. I want to really thank anthony aka magus x1 for joining us today no um, problem you know of course it was my pleasure oh yeah of course and if you guys have any comments or questions of course you can email the down phoenix show at gmail.com just drop a comment on youtube or podomatic um and of course if you have itunes don't forget to subscribe to us on itunes and we're also on stitcher in case you like to listen that way um but i think that's all the time we have for now uh so you have any last thoughts to say or well, it was awesome being on here, and I hope to come back. All right. Yeah, you're always welcome. Uh, but till then, Down Phoenix out. So thank you guys for tuning in to another episode of DP and Me. If you want other ways to listen to the podcast, it's available on YouTube, iTunes, Stitcher, as well as Podomatic. Just look for DP and Me. I would like to thank Anthony for joining us on the show. All music is provided by TechnoX. Look for TechnoX on YouTube, T-E-K-N-O-A-X-E, if you want royalty-free music for your own podcasts, YouTube videos, and so on. 
So thanks again for listening, and Down Phoenix out.